All right, welcome back to Computer Science E259. My name is David Malin, and this is lecture three on DOM. So now things start to get pretty fun, I think, because now we're entering the world of data structures, considering questions of performance, ultimately, and a variety of other topics. But before we forge ahead, a couple of announcements, and then a look back. Uh, first announcement is that Project One was distributed a couple weeks ago. It is due in two weeks' time. You have the fortune of having a holiday, uh, thanks to Columbus, this coming Monday. So so this project for the syllabus is due on the 15th, which is two weeks hence. So you have a bit of a buffer this week. Uh, we'll then resume next time, two weeks hence, with XSLT, this language written in an XML syntax that is itself a functional programming language. And we'll use that throughout the course. Uh, and secondly, section. So Per my listserv post, I'll do my best to try to roll these section conversations in either right at the end of class or perhaps in some weeks I'll give you advance notice if it sort of makes sense material-wise to do it beforehand for those of you who can make it. And in those circumstances, I'll record them by audio so that uh, those of you tuning in at uh, home have a way to follow along. Okay, so last time we looked at XML in a sentence. What's XML? You're smiling, which means I get to nominate to you, if I may. Okay, a way to put context around text. Perfect, I'll put it another way. Uh, it's a way to uh, semantically tag data with, say, metadata, sort of another view on it, tossing in some jargon. Okay, so we've got this file full of open brackets and closed brackets and elements, ultimately. What's SAX good for? Yeah, exactly. So this is the simple API for XML, and it's good for parsing that file. At the end of the day, you presumably want to extract useful information from the file. SAX is one such way. It is a quick and dirty API, if you will, in that it allows you to get uh, write your code fairly quickly. It's also more uh, specifically a fire and forget kind of API, this being sort of jargon to describe the notion that you have sort of this streaming access to your data, not necessarily in the sense that the data is coming in off the wire, but rather you have one and only one chance to do something with the data that's being parsed because of the events are being fired again and again based on the parsing of that document. So there appears to be this need, or at least this opportunity, for an alternative API that allows you to actually get at data arbitrarily, uh, get random access to the document as opposed to this serialized access that SACS gives you. So DOM today is about uh, answering that opportunity. Jack's P, I uh, didn't spend a huge amount of time on it yet, but just in a sentence, what is it? Yeah, good. And so it's the Java API that defines SACS or DOM, or more generally, it's all of the Java classes that collectively provide XML support that ship with Sun's JDK. Uh, Xerxes is what? It's just an implementation of an XML parser. Happens to be the one that ships commonly with a lot of products these days, free and commercial. Uh, it's the one we'll be using with Project One. At the very end, recall, we take off the so-called training wheels, and you actually use Xerxes. And Xerxes is what you'll be using largely throughout most of the course. Though, in theory, you should be able to substitute other XML parsers. Michael K., the author of one of our textbooks, recommended textbooks, has Saxon, uh, things like XML Spy and X, uh, Stylus Studio, two products we'll demonstrate in two weeks' time for which we have site licenses, uh, happen to have their own homegrown parsers built in, but they can also support plugins like Xerxes. So more on that to come. And then we talked about parsing as a segue toward Project One itself, parsing the act of uh, tokenizing a bunch of data and extracting the interesting components within it. And we did that in the context of my first parser. So we looked also at this, a representative document last time. Um, perhaps worthy of note here is we, had, we spent some time on the nomenclature, which in and of itself isn't terribly enlightening. But uh, uh, one trivia question here, C data sections. What are they, or what are they good for? Yeah, exactly. So C data is just character data in contrast with what we'll generally call PC data, parsed character data. So this is just text that's in the document, and it's data. It's not metadata. But you don't want the parser to interpret anything inside of it. So if you've got HTML sandwiched in there, as in this example, and you don't want the parser to, for instance, try to parse that as an XML element, 
or if you have, say, what are look like entities in there, or if you just have angled brackets that you don't want to have to rewrite with ampersand, LT, semicolon, well, you can effectively escape it, so to speak, in this C data section. I would say within the domain of XML, C data sections are very common if you want to just transmit some HTML content, JavaScript content, any kind of messy content that might have a well-defined syntax but doesn't jive well with XML. Sometimes it's useful, if borderline lazy, to just sandwich it in a C data section so that it doesn't uh, mess with any parser that might be reading the document. Ajax in that domain, which is we'll spend a lecture on later in the term, uh, it's uh, common to use uh, C data sections when using Ajax with XML. If you don't know what these are, they, uh, you eventually will. Uh, so that is to transmit down some JavaScript code or some HTML content. OK, so finally last time we looked at a bunch of demonstrations and a bunch of API related methods for SACs. Among them were start document, end document, start element, and so forth. And these quite simply were the methods, the event handlers that get invoked when a document's being parsed with the SACs API. So that's our last time in a nutshell. Any questions about last week's stuff? Anything at all? All right, so let's forge ahead. This time we have DOM level three, just a clunky way of saying version three of the DOM API. DOM stands for Document Object Model, which is just a big way of saying that this is just a tree-based view of XML data. It also applies to the world of HTML, or really XHTML. If you've ever heard about, uh, if you know JavaScript, uh, navigating the DOM inside of a JavaScript document, inside of a web page, it's the same idea. It's a way of modeling this very hierarchical data with nodes and leaves and children and all these sort of uh, tree-oriented data structures. We'll look again at JAXP, this time uh, more specifically at some functionality of Xerxes, and we'll also revisit my first parser in the context of DOM. All right, so who cares? Why bother? So SAX is useful in that it is uh, fairly well performing because it doesn't need to maintain much state or memory. It just literally is this fire and forget. It's useful for large documents that you just don't want to keep megabytes worth of or more of data around in memory. But among its downsides are exactly those same upsides, is that you don't have random access to your data. You sort of have one opportunity when that event handler is called to look at the data and do something with it. And if you don't, it has literally passed you by because the next SACS events will continue to fire pertinent to other data. So there's no way to do manipulation of data. There's no way to correlate data, and rather I should qualify that, easily. Because of course you could read a document using SACS, maybe tuck away every single element that you receive by way of start element in like a hash table or a linked list, but at that point, you're starting to build up your own data structure. Why not build up a data structure that itself captures the structure of your input? And that, of course, is DOM, this tree-based view of the world. So let's take a look at an example. Here's another representative document. This time we're talking about a Jim Bob student who's apparently a graduate. He's got some ID number, and he's nested inside of a student's element. So this is an example document, maybe an example database, if you will, XML database that's just one big flat file. But in this case, we apparently just have one student in it. Well, the equivalent DOM would be as follows. So what's interesting about this view of the world? The sort of definition by way of example. So at the top of a DOM is a so-called document element. This is the root of the tree, and this is a document. Rather, this is a node that doesn't have an analog in the document itself, but rather is the analog for the whole document itself. So you need some way of accessing everything at the so-called root level of the document, among which are, of course, the root element, of which there can be how many in an XML doc? So just one. All right. So just one, which might suggest that why don't we just use this as the root? Well, it turns out you can have other stuff at the top of a document. And you saw some of these things last time, and among them are comments, as might be obvious here. What's something else that can be at the top of the document? This is a bit of a trick question, because odds are I'll shoot down what you say. OK, so the XML declaration, which itself is a hint to the parser, but actually has no representation in the DOM, it turns out. What else was up there, potentially? So there is the doc type declaration, which similarly was an instruction effectively to the parser. So it, too, is not real data, and thus does not get embodied in the DOM. So two wrong answers, but there is one more. 
Right, these PIs. And you don't see these used terribly much. We'll see at least one example when we talk about XSLT, but these were the other things that could be open bracket, question mark, something. And so if those can be at the top of the document, so can comments, you needed a way of sort of keeping track of them all. And that's why you have this sort of Uber node, the so-called document node, beneath which everything else is. So these are the two children of the document node. Well, who's a child of the student's node? Well, conceptually, just one student. So we have the arrow pointing down at his child. Uh, but it looks like, actually, that this guy has three children. How is that possible? Yeah, so there was this issue of white space. And the rule of thumb thus far is that if there's white space in the document, even though it might look irrelevant to you, the human, to an XML parser by default, it is significant. It is not ignorable unless you tell the parser it's ignorable, but more on that when we get to DTDs and schemas. For now, it's, it, it's significant. And so we embody that using a so-called text node in contrast to a so-called element node. And here we have backslash n, backslash t, which is capturing the white space that appears to be right here. So backslash n, that's presumably a backslash t, a tab character. So we've got that as the first child. The next sibling is this. And then the final sibling is this new line character, which is apparently right here is the idea. Now this is just a conceptual view. Uh, inside of a DOM are not only elements and comment nodes and document nodes, but also attribute nodes. Um, they conceptually are typically hung off uh, an element node sort of laterally. And this is arbitrary, but it's one way of viewing the world. And that, mean, that is at least to say that they're not children of anything per se but rather they are associated with elements. And here's an oddity, and this you will see in the API, and it's useful to know when it comes to start writing code against this. This is not a child, an attribute is not a child of an element. But the parent of an attribute is the element. Okay, so this is not the child of an element. So this guy has no children, at least, well, that's a lie. So pretend we're not looking down. This guy has no children called ID. But this attribute called ID has a parent called student. So it's just a way of, if you're given an attribute node, it's, it's in the same spirit of like a linked list so that there's at least an arrow going in one direction so that you can traverse this tree effectively. Um, minor detail, but that one might typically, might very well stumble across while coding stuff up. All right, what about student? So student seems to have a backslash n, backslash t, then this name element. Looks like another backslash n, backslash t, another, uh, a status element, then a backslash n. One, two, three, four, five. So there are all of those. And actually student, should this be here? Status, interesting. Should this be here? That backslash t should not be there, I believe. Uh, looking at the name of the student. So this is the name of the student, yeah. Right, so I'm pointing, though, this text node, which corresponds to the white space after status. Oh, there it is, there it is. Okay, so it's backslash n, backslash t. Yep, there we go. I got off track. Okay, all right, so we have those five children there, three of which are text, two of which are elements, and then these elements in turn just have textual children. So this too is worthy of note. In a DOM, Rather, in the SACS API, recall that there was this minor detail that I mentioned, which was that if you have a SACS event for t uh, characters called, the character SACS event, recall that all of our examples assume that if you had a string of contiguous text that was passed along to your software by way of one invocation of characters. But we also cautioned last time that technically, if the parser wanted to be really ridiculous, it could invoke characters once for every one of the characters that just happened to be contiguous. Once, though, you have a DOM, by definition, there's, most DOMs are assumed to be normalized, so to speak, which means unlike the SAX world, when you are playing in the DOM world and writing code with the DOM API, you can trust that any text nodes, any adjacent text nodes have been collapsed into one which is to say, if you want to get the textual content of a node, it's just going to be in the single text child. You don't have to worry about concatenating together multiple text nodes together, which is a good thing. It just means less work for the developer. So minor distinction to bear in mind. All right. Um, yeah, please. OK. OK. 
No. So. So yes, yeah, so to summarize, a SACS parser parses a document top to bottom, left to right. And so it encounters, it's like doing a um, depth first search of the tree that's implicit in an XML document. SACS just in, tells you, uh, it's like a, tr it's a, uh, um, it's a depth first search traversal of the tree, and each time it visits a new node in the tree, it fires an event. DOM does that same idea at the end of the day, but it hands you the entire structure that it's traversed. So they are navigating the same tree, but only DOM provides you with a, an explicit tree-like view of the world. Yeah. But yes, it's the same data that's being parsed. Mm -hmm. OK. Absolutely. If you take out all these tab characters, yes, it will look uglier to a human, but perfectly valid, unless there's some requirement in, say, an XML schema that there needs to be something like white space that's there, but which is usually not the case. OK? But more on white space to come eventually. Um, this just kind of summarizes some of what we say, so I'll put this up there as reference, uh, but. Yeah, I think the one takeaway worth mentioning here at the very bottom is that conceptually you can sort of think of these DOMs as this hybrid between what is clearly a tree, but then also in terms of these attributes, you have this sort of linked list structure. Relevant when it comes time for you to implement support, if you haven't already, for attributes in project one. Not just for SACS, but as promised this week and for the next two weeks, implementing the DOM-oriented support, presumably you're going to be building a structure exactly like this in memory, albeit with some maybe design liberties on your part. Question. Yep. The attributes are being placed that, that means if the student is having another attribute, I will add the if I, ah, sure. I should put arrow from the ID and put another uh, attribute there? Or? Sure. So to summarize what to do if you have multiple attributes. Conceptually, it would be reasonable to just keep linking them here as a sort of lateral linked list. But again, this is just a visualization. That's actually an interesting design question for, say, project one, because what you're going to have to do is somehow retain what are called atter nodes in your DOM for project one. But it's ultimately going to be up to you to figure out how to store those. Do you use an array, a vector, a linked list, a hash table? It really doesn't matter so long as you're implementing the API. But it does matter when, uh, if some of your metrics for success, say outside the course, are performance and ease of accessibility and such. But yet, for simplicity, assume it's just a linked list going from left to right, visually. Other questions? OK, so just to summarize the nodes that do exist in DOM, and this is, applies to not only XML, but also, in, by extension, XHTML, and thus JavaScript. And we'll see more of this when it comes time to do the AJAX part of the course, because a lot of, the, a lot of this DOM stuff will actually come back. We'll revisit it, uh, for better or for worse, in the world of AJAX, because many of the JavaScript functions that navigate AJAX return data, if it happens to be XML, treat the return data as a DOM. Because essentially, the browser parses the returned XML, if you're using XML in the first place, and then allows you to traverse it using DOM functions, very much like the DOM methods you'll see in the JAXP API. But we don't spend all that much time writing DOM code in Java, because frankly, it's a pain. It does not give you a very nice API. There exist better third-party solutions that are just popular. Um, one of them is called JDOM, actually. And this is an API that students often employ come semester's end for their final project because it implements the same idea, tree-like navigation of an XML document, but it's just designed with the developer's convenience in mind. There's fewer hoops to jump through. Um, this DOM API isn't even Java-specific. It's written in IDL, an intermediate definition language, and which just the effect of which in this particular case is that it's so damn generalized that it looks nice on paper. It's a pain to code against. So we at least tend not to use it so much in the course. Or really, in general, it's a pain. Um, better languages exist, like XPath, which we will get to in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so what's the relationship here? Is there any? So really, they're not fundamentally related, but it turns out that you can certainly build a DOM out of SACS events. Because after all, SACS events tell you when all of the interesting things in what could be a DOM are happening, the start of an element, the start of characters. Each of those events essentially triggers, could trigger the creation of a new node in the 
data structure you're building in memory. And in fact, that's precisely the approach you'll take in project one, is to build on top of your SACS related code a DOM builder, so to speak, whereby in response to each of the salient, uh, the related SACS events, you'll simply instantiate the appropriate type of node, maybe a text node, maybe an element node, maybe an atter node, again, based on the SACS event that you're seeing. So in that sense, they can be related, but there's not necessarily an inherent relationship there. It's just, just one of utility. All right, so let's take a look at how we can build out a specific DOM like this out of SACS events. In other words, consider this, again, one of the very few PowerPoint animations you'll ever see in this class to simply help capture the process that really you'll be implementing yourself in project one. So suppose this is our sample document, again, very short and sweet so that it fits nicely in an animation. And here are the three parts of the story. Here's going to be the document, the XML coming in character by character, and not in a streaming sense, but just we open the file handle and we start calling get C or the equivalent on the file. Here's going to be the DOM we're going to build up. And then here's going to be the SAX handler that is triggered in response to the parsing of this document line by line, character by character. So the, the flow of this story is essentially going to be as follows. All right, so start document is the first thing called. And this is the same demonstration really as last time. We haven't parsed anything just yet. But the first thing we need to now do when start document is invoked is construct the beginning of our DOM. So here's how the story, here's the context for the story. If you wanted to build a DOM, turns out so that to use the language of last week, all you have to implement are SACS event handlers. Or more specifically in Java, you have to implement which interface from last time? Uh, yeah, close. The, the interface was content handler, but really that just amounts to extending that default handler. So literally, even though we last week in SACS Demo 1 and SACS Demo 2 just did these little baby applications that just printed out the corresponding pseudocode, had I taken some time, I could have in that lecture taken the time to call new a lot and instantiate new nodes every time each of those event handlers was invoked, those SACS events, and I could have started building up a tree. Well, this week is precisely that. Um, Based on this invocation, rather than just have a print line in there, this time I'm going to have a call like uh, node n equals new node. And the type of that node is going to be a document node. I'm going to somehow have to keep track of the fact that I just instantiated that node so I can continue to build this tree out. But that's ultimately what project one has you do. All right, so whoops, the next characters that fall into place are these. So we've just parsed, for instance, open bracket students, close bracket. The event handler, obviously, to be called is what? Start element. And we're past the name of this thing. So the corresponding SACS event looks like that. No attributes. And again, that's our pseudocode. Interpret as you will. What now needs to happen in the DOM, given that the next event to happen was the encountering of an element? No, so we clearly need an element node, and presumably it's going to get hung off of the document node, because as the first such element, it's the so-called root element of the document. So what my implementation of start element does is not just call print line like last week, but rather uh, instantiate a new node, this time of type element. And somehow, assuming I kept around the, rel the, the necessary references, I'm going to have to hang that off as a child of the document node. And therein lies some of the implementation details for project one. So there's that node there. What's the next thing to happen? Well, apparently in that sample document, there came some white space off of which node, without looking at your prefabbed handouts, is this text node going to be a child of? Okay, so it's going to be the question, the candidates are the document node or this node. The white space in question is apparently backslash n and then backslash t. So that's inside of the students, uh, whoops, inside of the students element. So it's actually a child of students, not of the document. So the white space in question, to be clear, starts here and apparently continues down here. That's literally inside the students element because it comes after its open tag. And so we have that appearing as a child of the element. And I'm not sure uh, why all of a sudden the bottoms of my notes have disappeared, but let's assume those are complete. All right, what comes next in our representative document? Well, it was that student node. This time it did have an ID. Which SACS event gets fired then? 
Easy one. Another start element. So this time, where is this node going to be hung off of? Child of students, exactly. So it's a sibling of that text because it's at the same level. So the sax event that gets fired might look like that in pseudocode. And again, as you just said, the node to get created is this. And this time we're going to hang the attribute node off visually as a sort of lateral linked list. But that's sort of arbitrary and just helps us visualize it. The next thing that the next sax event handler to get invoked without looking down. Good. End elements, yes? Right, so end element of student, because again, this was one of these so-called empty elements. So realize you've got to have the symmetry. What, mu what starts must end. Oh, is that not where you, were, where you were going? No? OK, so here we have end element. So what happens now in the picture here? OK, good. So nothing happens in the picture. Now think like a developer implementing this tree on the right. What must happen behind the scenes? inside the code that's building out this DOM. Yeah, so you essentially have to pop a stack of something. You have to go up one level, both conceptually and with your, so with your references. Right? Presumably, I've been building this tree essentially by keeping my finger or by keeping a variable that's a reference to a node on the node that should receive the next node as a child. But as soon as I see end element, that means whatever node I've been hanging children off of is no longer going to be the parent of anything else because we call it end element. So conceptually, it's like moving my finger from pointing to this node back up to this node because this guy is closed, literally. So now the only place I might hang the next element thus far is off of this guy up until the point that he too is ended by an end element. Well, next we have some characters. So which node, again, without looking down, does this backslash n become a text node child of? Students. Students, good, excellent. And kind of a leading question too when you have just enough space to fit the node there. What happens next? What's the next sax event to be called? Well, we see this in the document. So there's another end element. So conceptually, my finger now moves up to the root of the document, aka the document node. And again, this is poor choice of names. The root of the document um, actually, it's sort of an ambiguous term. Here's the root of our DOM, but here's the root element. So unfortunate potential confusion. But really, our story is about to end, because there we have end documents. So at this point, it doesn't matter where my finger is, but presumably it's here, which is just as well, because the act of returning a DOM to the developer is going to be the act of just returning, as in any data structures class, the root of the thing that you just built. Because from that node, can you get everywhere else? So that's it. I mean, that essentially is Project One's DOM components that is up to you to build, the so-called DOM building part of the code. So to summarize, these are the types of uh, nodes that exist that are at least relevant um, for, say, Project One, and really for most DOM-related code that you might write. And the dot, dot, dot is just for things like processing instructions and the like. Um, but all of them, there is some hierarchy descend from a general node type. And that's useful for polymorphic reasons and the like, because you can traverse the tree without worrying usually about what type of node that you've encountered. So what's in this interface? And this will be a good segue to looking at some of the Java doc here. So a node has a name, a value, a list of children, a list of attributes, and a reference to its parent. So pretty much all of the sort of pointers you would hope would exist in the definition of a node that allow you to get from one node to any other. The DOM API essentially prescribes that you must be able to get at the children using certain method calls, but it doesn't really it doesn't say anything about how you would implement that list of children, but it turns out that a linked list is really the most sensible for reasons that will be apparent when we glance at the API. Um, realize that for completeness's sake, because all of these nodes descend from this node class, they all have names and values and lists of children, lists of attributes, and again, a parent reference, even if that's meaningless. So for instance, a text node, the nodes that we were putting white space in and things like Jim Bob and whatnot, they have name, they have a field for a name, and they have a field for a value, only the values used in the case of a text node. By contrast, an element has a name, 
but it doesn't have a value, at least in its own node. We'll change that story when we get to XSLT and XPath. Uh, an attribute certainly can't have an attribute. So I can't even imagine what that would look like. But again, for completeness' sake, because atter happens to be a node, those fields exist. But in JAXP, they're just assumed to be, they're supposed to be left as null. So that's just the idea. And it's useful for writing code that can just check for null to really check what kind of node you're dealing with, or at least you can traverse things without having to special case many of your nodes. And there are other ways to figure out, not even through introspection, exactly what type of node you are. So um, what does the DOM API do for you? All this stuff at the bottom. It pretty much gives you all the types of methods that you might think about if you wanted to get at data in your document by way of a tree-like structure. Get next child, get parent, uh, get attributes, those kinds of methods. And we'll glance at that in a sec. So let's see, DOM level three. What's the best order in which to show this? So let's jump ahead of ourselves, actually. I'm going to pull up the website. OK, again, a, part, a marginally easier thing to type is computer science. 259.org, and it will redirect you to the site. Um, we want to go to resources. Again, perhaps one of the most useful pages on the site, if any, are, is this one for resources with the APIs up top. Let's go to JAXP, and let's look up, for instance, uh, the so-called, let's see, uh, scroll down to the document. So it's italicized on the left, which means it's an interface. But notice that it descends from a super interface, a parent interface called node. And if we scroll over to the node interface, we'll see many of the things that we just described. A bit more, to be sure. Here we have some constants, but. Here, essentially, is a long list of all the types of methods you can call using the DOM API. Here's the DOM API on a node. So get first child, get last child, get next sibling, get node name. And again, some of those methods, even though they're there, they might very well return, say, null, if it just doesn't make sense for a certain node. But again, Javadoc in this course will be your friend, since it would not be at all interesting, I think, to walk ourselves through the two dozen or so methods that relate to just nodes, but realize that it's the concepts, hopefully, that are instructive. And then when it comes time to write some of this stuff, again, the Java doc will fill in any of the blanks. Um, one of the best features about Java, perhaps, and bootstrapping yourself to um, new material is, I think, that kind of documentation. So. One word about interfaces and about implementations. So um, there's in this middle of this slide, which is meant to be more of a reference than anything, um, you will find when you're writing anything related to JAXP that there's both these generalized classes, these interfaces, the API itself, and there's underlying implementations. So we called Xerxes an XML parser before, and it is. And it is implemented by way of a bunch of packages and a bunch of classes. But those classes implement an API that is interfaces defined by the JAXP standard, by Sun and by whoever else collaborated to come up with that API. So even though in theory you could instantiate a node object in memory by coding against Xerxes' own API, that's not what you should be doing, because your code is just not then platform independent or parser independent. Rather, you write things against the more generalized API interface definitions so that you can plug in Saxon or Crimson or Xerxes or any other XML parser, which, assuming they're implemented correctly, they should also implement those interfaces as well. So just a comment on that so that when you see other class names and might look up documentation specific to Xerxes, realize that you should almost never make even mention of things like Xerxes in your own code. Um, Sun took care of that by essentially installing Xerxes underneath the hood for uh, their latest Java releases. And even that's a bit of a white lie, because even the latest version of the JDK ships with an older version of Xerxes and this other thing called Zalin, which we override by way of jars in an endorse directory. And that's why you go through in the appendix in installing some of those things in special places. But more on that next time um, when we look at Zalin. OK, so let's see. OK, so let's fly through some of these in order to get to one of the demonstrations of this stuff.
So, well, this is just a summary, actually, I think, of what we looked at. But there's one thing I will note. When it comes time to create an actual DOM, which is probably not something you'll be inclined to do in Java, and you won't be required to do for the course, is OK, we're back. So just a word and a promise about namespaces. You will increasingly see throughout a lot of our representative documents and things you start seeing in projects that a lot of XML elements seem to be of the form foo colon var. Var is the name of the element, as you'll start seeing, and foo is some kind of prefix. Well, those prefixes have to do with what are called namespaces, which is perhaps a topic familiar to you, whether you're coming from C or the idea of packages in Java. There's this way of just creating little boxes inside of which variables and other uh, symbols can exist independent of others. Same idea exists in XML. It's implemented a little differently from a traditional programming language by way of these prefixes. Um, although C++ has this, if you've ever had to write std colon, uh, it? std colon c out, I think is the syntax. If you don't include double, double quotes, okay. So std um, colon colon c out and c in. If you don't just include using namespace standard at the top, same idea. Um, exists in many different contexts. So we'll see these, we'll get to the implications of these, but they become increasingly useful once we start intermingling languages in this course. And we're going to start doing that in two weeks' time when we get to XSLT, because we're going to use XSLT to churn out, among other things, XHTML. So we're going to be writing XHTML and XSLT in the same file. And so to distinguish those two different types of elements, those different types of open and closed tags, we're going to use prefixes so that the program reading your code knows what's XHTML and knows what is instead XSLT. This will be useful as well when we get to schema or we get to SVG uh, or even other languages that might crop up. So more to come. All right, so my first XML parser. So this, again, is the package inside of which all of Project One's code is, except for the part uh, attribute converter related to Xerxes. Uh, DOM Builder Demo looks as follows. So DOM Builder Demo, let's see how best to run this. So we need that. So DOM Builder Demo, let's call it a sort of teaser will work once your own implementation of DOM for Project 1 is working. What this program does is as follows. In the main routine here, we first, like before, and we're not even doing much error checking this time for quick and dirty purposes, we're grabbing the uh, first command line argument and treating that as the file name that we want to ultimately parse. The two lines we're going to use here, because this again is in our sandbox of Project 1. So we've tried to name almost all of the classes identically to the real ones, but they are simplified forms of them. So we have an XML parser, which I'm instantiating. Then I'm going to instantiate a DOM builder, aka document builder. And then I'm going to call this parse routine. Well, it turns out that what this thing does is as follows. This DB is again our DOM builder um, code, which is going to ultimately represent our DOM. And I don't want to spend too much time on this here, because I think it's better walkthrough in the spec, and in a uh, code walkthrough we'll do in a moment. But essentially, by calling that line there, part of which I've highlighted, we can get back the root of the DOM that your own code, ideally, will have built up in memory, based on a series of SACS events implementing that story, that animation we walked through earlier. What this demo code is going to do once you deploy it on your own DOM is ideally count the number of elements and count the number of text nodes in whatever XML document it was that you happen to read in. So again, it's just another example of code, this time not written from the official API, but rather to be consistent with your own type of code. We have this recursive method in here, very similar in spirit to slash prices, but where slash prices was consistent with the real API, this is an example of how you would write code against our own uh, my first project, uh, my first parser version of the world. And here we're just switching on the type of node that we pass to this visit method. And all it's going to do by way of these global variables here, or these instance variables, is increment counters for the number of text nodes we encounter, which is pretty easy. And for the element nodes, the interesting part about the element nodes is that you've got to recurse potentially, because elements might have child elements. And so here we have code similar in spirit to what we had in the real API. But again, notice for the sake of simplification, 
Whereas the real API had that node list class, well, we're just going to reuse what Java gives us for free. There's already the idea of a list interface, which is implemented with like a linked list in Java. So we represent our list of children just with the off-the-shelf Java uh, 2 second edition idea of a list. We return that. We use an iterator here from standard Java. We just iterate over each of these nodes and we visit them. Leap of faith, we leave it to visit to determine what type of node they are. So we might in fact be iterating over or recursing rather on attribute nodes and other things, but that's fine because we'll still we have those base cases up top. Okay? So just a, a teaser of code that ideally should be able to tell you once your DOM building code is working for project one how many text elements there are and how many element nodes there are in a document. And the, use, the, the reason we offer this kind of code is that this is something that you as a human can very easily check when debugging your own code. Because if you look at your sample document of foo elements and bar elements and baz elements that you yourself might type, at the pro, uh, type up for dem, uh, testing purposes, presumably you can count on your hands how many elements are in there and you can run this code against it and make sure that you're building your DOM at least partially correctly. All right, so let's look at project one. Again, uh, you should, if you've not dived into project one before, uh, in theory, Columbus has saved you because you do have sufficient time still to dive in, especially if you join the course late. But certainly do, I recommend, try to bite off a good third of the projects in future weeks each week. So Ant is the build tool we'll use. I already compiled this a bit ago. Uh, I'm going to dive then into our source directory and into MF for my first. And here's all those files that we spent a few minutes at the end of last Monday looking at. I rattled off the, meth, uh, the classes that were relevant to the SACS portion of the assignment. I get to get off the hook tonight by saying all of the classes that we didn't look at last week are hereby relevant now, since we've looked at DOM-related stuff. But you can probably pluck them out. And it's a little cut off over there, but you can see almost all of the letters. Attributes. Just as a quick quiz, was relevant to which API, DOM or SAX? So that was SAX. The Atter class we've seen tonight, and that's the class that represents our idea of an attribute in DOM speak. But notice that it extends this idea of a node. And that node is one of our other files, which apparently, and this is pretty consistent with the spec, even if a little simplified, has the notion of children associated with it, which is a linked list. Uh, it has the notion of a name, a parent, and a value. And those were as expected. And this convention of just putting these underscores after the variables names is just a convention that makes clear to some programmers, myself for instance, that that's a local private instance variable as opposed to something else. Uh, not necessary, but useful. Here we have some constants that are defined that allow us to do that so-called introspection to figure out what type of node something is without using instance of. And here we have some of these fundamental helper routines, if you will. Here's a generalized method that's in the node class with which you can append a child to your node. That's probably going to be useful when you have to build a DOM in memory. We're giving you a get child nodes method, which is easy because it just returns the linked list of children you're maintaining. Get node name is trivial. Just return the string. Get node type. Um, that's something that you're going to need to implement in subclasses. I think we did it in a couple of them, but when you implement Atter, it'll be left to you to implement that if we haven't already. Get node values easy, it's just a string. Get parent nodes, going to be up to you to make sure that there's actually a reference in this thing called parent, uh, at least for attribute nodes as well. Uh, and set node name and set node value. Some setters come with these getters. So that's the node class, and perhaps worthy of note is that it's in DOM Builder that most of your DOM building code needs to go. And unfortunately, we haven't given you much here at all. We have a reference to a document node. We plucked that one off for you. Unfortunately, this thing doesn't work yet. All we do is return that thing right now, which is great, but there's clearly no code that actually builds the DOM. So what you're presumably going to do given that DOM Builder extends default handler, is proceed when you're ready to implement what here? 
Yeah, exactly. Just those Saks event handlers we spent last week really talking about, and we've seen again tonight, we extend default handler, which means we've got for free all of those content handler methods, like start element and end element and start document and end document. Unfortunately, they all just do nothing right now, and that's why if you run this code, it'll compile and run, but your DOM's going to come back as an empty null reference. Nothing's there. What you need to effectively implement in dombuilder.java is that story we told by way of the three-pointed uh, simulation that took the document to the sax events to the DOM building code. Well, it's the DOM building code that belongs in this file. So you just need to implement start document and document, start element and element, and characters. And I think it's those five that collectively implement the API. You don't. Ah, so in your so what you're doing for the SACS portion of the problem set is implementing you're implementing new parts of the parser, not of SACS per se. So what you're implementing here, the DOM building part of the assignment, is to build SACS, uh, is to build SACS event handlers that just so happen to build a DOM. So you're not actually doing this already. All of your other attention will have been focused on the parser itself. This, uh, this is a method you uh, had or Why do you need to handle this? So right now I'm returning the root of my document. But clearly it's, well, by default, variables like this are initialized to null in Java. So right now, if I instantiate a DOM builder and then call it get document, I will get back a reference, namely the reference called doc underscore. But it's null. That means there's no DOM there. What I want to be able to do is this. In my tester.java, which we glanced at, I think, last time to demonstrate exactly how you can test your code as well with the code we distribute. There's two test cases here, and I'll defer to the spec to explain exactly how to run this code. But just to make more clear the story we're trying to tell with this project, in this case too, in this testing harness, which we give you, uh, that is explained in the spec, it has you instantiate a DOM builder object, which you're going to implement the inner workings of. It then calls parse, passing in the file name to parse, and then this thing, a reference to your DOM builder. What is a DOM builder? Well, it implements, it extends default handler, which means implicitly it is a content handler. Content handlers, it's just sax handlers, which means it should be implementing start element, end element, and so forth. So the idea here is that this is the parser you write parts of for project one. Parts of that parser trigger, they don't, um, they call SACS event handlers, but they don't, you don't implement the SACS event handlers. This code calls start element, and it's in this document builder code that you actually implement those SACS event handlers. So it's the DOM builder's event handlers that get invoked by your parser, which is calling those SACS events. <coughs> by the end of this call, the purpose of this content handler's uh, existence is to, as it's handling all these SACS events, is to be allocating more and more and more and more RAM, creating in turn more and more nodes that it's somehow weaving together in the form of a tree, so that when this parsing process is complete, what's left inside that doc underscore reference is a reference to the whole tree that's been built based on the parsing process. This line here just gets the so-called root element, and then we do some stuff down here to test that it actually works, namely the testing harness reads in the file, calls your DOM, which presumably builds a really big tree in memory, depending on the size of the document, and then we just serialize it right back out. The, uh, the idea being, if your input doesn't look like your output, there's something wrong in the middle. And the only thing in the middle is your DOM building code. So I would again point you at the spec and also at our uh, walkthrough from the section notes, which um, offers a bit more detail and a bit more hints um, as to what the story is, is behind this. But if it's still unclear, the one, the five-minute part of this video that I dare say might be worth watching again is this one. <laughs>
because this is what you're implementing for the DOM portion of project one is that story. And specifically, you're implementing this third of the story. Yes, you are implementing SAX event handlers, or more precisely, you're implementing DOM building code in the form of a content handler. Same way of saying it, or different way of saying the same thing. Other questions? Okay, so where to go after this? So next time, which is two weeks hence, we will look at the first of these XML-derived languages, namely XSLT. And with that will come XPath, which is a wonderfully useful and fairly straightforward query language with which you can treat your document literally as a hierarchical tree, similar to a file system, and then using these path-like expressions that use forward slashes very much in the file system sense to go deeper and deeper and deeper into your document, can you get back arbitrary amounts of data. Uh, we'll look at CSS briefly only because it relates in spirit to the idea of XSLT, which is a style sheet language, but the similarities are very, very slim. And CSS is very powerless, uh, fairly powerless when it comes to manipulation of XML, whereas XSLT is a true programming language. And by extension, we'll look at Tracks, the transformation API uh, for XML. Essentially, JAXP is divided perhaps uh, divided, and this is a bit of a white lie, into all of the code that handles, uh, say, parsing by a SACS and DOM, and then also all the code that handles transformations by way of XSLT, but it's a white lie because there's some other stuff in there too. But this is the other big branch of the functionality that JAXP provides, and clearly the community likes using sexy acronyms for these things. And we'll look next time at Project 2. The teaser for Project 2 is that there are uh, three components. The first is to implement, will be to implement a sort of uh, what we've dubbed myblockbuster.com, which will take an XML database, a flat file of data with movie titles and ratings and photographs and whatnot, and will have you generate with XSLT a blockbuster.com like website. A simple one, but it's meant to be a stepping stone to the second. Uh, part of the project, which will give you a much larger file, several hundred kilobytes, which, as I mentioned in the first lecture, contains all possible data we could dig up on London's tubes, trains, and trams, the London Underground, the geography of it all, the colors of the lines, the names of the lines, all of this data that you will then render both in XHTML so that you have an MBTA-like website that just shows you the various routes and connections, and then also a graphical depiction of it using SVG, scalable vector graphics, such that by project's end, you will have a geographically accurate visualization with lots of lines and dots that represent collectively all that's underground in London. So it's quite cool. It's one of my favorite projects. And second only to project three, which once we get to project three will be my favorite, and project four, which will be my new favorite then too. So we'll see you in two weeks, and I'll stick around now for questions. That's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. You need to. Exactly. So I'm saying all those, all those functionality are not inside that particular method. It's, it's somewhere else in the class. Well, it, it's there. It's just doing nothing. Because notice that the code, DOM builder, doesn't implement content handler, so to speak, but rather it extends default handler, which last week we promised was a wonderfully useful but simultaneously useless class that just gives these null implementations of everything. So yes, DOM Builder does implement the entire content handler API as defined in project one, but those methods do nothing. They return. So it's complete. This is why it compiles. This is why it runs, but this is also why it does nothing currently. Yep. Sure, in project one? <coughs> are we even in the DOM, the DOM over demo? Um, I'm just trying to see how, how everything fits together. Sure, so. Is it the main method? Mm -hmm. um, oh, the parse method, yes? Yeah. OK. So here's the parse method. Takes two things, two arguments, the name of the file to parse, 
and then a reference to a handler whose event handler should be invoked every time something interesting is encountered. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? I mean, on the, for, this, for the SACS part of the project one, mm -hmm. should we be doing the parsing in here itself of the document? Yes. All, all the parsing thing that happens here and that gets passed to, as data? Yes. <coughs> all parsing for project one should happen in XML parser.java. And notice, we've implemented most of the, this is a SACS parser. So just to make maybe some of the jargon clear, it is a SACS parser because, for instance, notice that here we are still in our parse method of XML parser. Now notice that down here, the last thing we do is we call start document, but not my implementation of start document. We call whatever event handler was handed to me's version of start document. Then I call read element because now I got more parsing to do. But once I'm done reading element, which presumably is the root element and everything inside of it, then it's my turn again to just call end document, but not my own version of end document, whatever was implemented by the guy whose handler I've been passed. So this is a SACS parser in the XML parser.java is a SACS parser in the sense that it parses an XML document and every time it encounters something interesting, it triggers a SACS event. What SACS event? or rather, whose SACS event handler? Well, whatever handler was passed to it. Your DOM builder.java file is going to be a content handler that because it implements start document, end document, characters, and so forth, can be used to receive a sequence of SACS events and from them infer enough information to go and build the corresponding DOM. It doesn't have to be done this way. You could write from scratch a parser that parses a document and just starts building the DOM in memory as it goes. We, though, have this layer of abstraction where you write a SACS parser, and it turns out you can use that same code to build a DOM. Maybe you'd be a little more efficient if you re-architected the whole thing, re-implemented your parser, and just put the DOM building code in your parser, but there's trade-offs to that, too, of course. One, the implementation time, and two, um, now you just overwrote your SACS parser, or it's a pain to maintain both of them now. So that's the distinction. Yeah? We do. So you're allowed to modify some of the files, and they'll tell you up top if you are allowed to. So you may modify this file and such. We provide you with a minimal set of functionality. Um, odds are you're welcome to put any number of new methods. I would say that you might as well just make them all private, because all you're expected to support is this API. Um, all that you're required to support is this API, but you can certainly add methods that help with those implementations. And by all means, you can in add more methods that mimic the true DOM and SACS APIs, but I would say only if that interests you. Right? No one's going to use your code, so it has value only in the uh, experience. Other? Sure. So you will. You should, you'll need to understand all of them. And there's a bunch of them, but none of them are terribly large. The only one that's really kind of large is like the XML parser, but that's where you're going to be spending most of your time. The files you'll definitely have to modify are, let me double check a couple things so that I speak correctly. OK, anything with a to-do. So maybe, <laughs> OK, so you have to modify attributes.java, uh, dombuilder.java, XML serializer.java, and then the other files you may want to modify, um, but you might not need to. Uh, it is. It might. I guess it just doesn't say to do. Let's say. I guess you got the empty version. So let's see. In read start tag. Read. Oh, yeah, so I just, OK, so think of this line here as a big old to-do. <laughs> OK, so that's not a perfect heuristic to use grep. But I would say most of your time is clearly spent in XML parser, um, definitely in, what did we just say? Definitely in DOM builder, clearly. 
Um, serializer, yes too, because you need to support serialization of attributes. And then the other stuff is you may modify and you may need to, but I think it will become apparent what if anything, if there's anything more to be implemented, you'll realize it as you tackle the, the lowest hanging fruit, the ones that the spec explicitly directs your attention toward. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> now let's give some hints for the problem set. <laughs> Other questions? Do feel free to start mingling out the door. I'll stick around with que for questions. Yep. Mm -hmm. to, to one spend time doing the cleanup of the, of the, of the XML before I even call the start element or read element? What do you mean by cleanup of the XML? Um, you need to remove all the white space and all that, you know, get the characters and all. And, uh, okay, so that's a good question, and it's come up over the listserv about, like, do you preserve white space around equal signs and that sort of stuff? So you have to go back to the basic definitions. Is there any way in the model for XML to capture the amount of white space around, say, equal signs? Well, no. I mean, we haven't seen any way in DOM. XML itself has no, assigns no meaning to that kind of white space. And so even if it's there in the input document, you conceptually have no way of retaining it. So that white kind of white space should just be ignored. By contrast, if you encounter white space inside of some quotation marks, as say the, the value of some attribute, well, this white space, say here or here, should be preserved, but it's easy to do so because this is just going to be a string as the value of one of your nodes in, say, DOM. So when you say cleaning up, I would almost push back that it's meaningless because if you're parsing the document to be consistent with the grammar, then you're just going to be ignoring all of that fluff anyway because you have no means of retaining that information. And if you do have means, if your serializer is somehow able to spit out literally the same document character for character, then something's probably wrong because somehow you're remembering information you shouldn't be able to remember. And by that I mean if we have some crazy things in the inputs like well, a huge amount of white space after the equal sign and your serializer ends up printing out that same white space, we're going to ask how because how did you retain that in the model in a model that doesn't allow for retention of that. So I shouldn't bother even cleaning up that as, I mean. Well I don't know what you mean by cleaning it up, right? I mean, what I thought was before it even goes to the, uh, the read, uh, read Oh, I see. You know, I clean up everything and then, you know, make it as clean as possible and then send it out. Because in, in I think five and six there's the all those, you know, spaces and. So, okay, so you could pre-parse the whole document and just pretty it up and just make it, put it in some canonical format where all of this kind of fluffy white space is just stripped out. But then you're going to have to reparse the whole document anyway to actually parse it in a literal sense and trigger those SACS events or build out the DOM, which means you just double the amount of time it takes for you to parse your document. So I think my answer here is just no. Whatever you're describing, don't do that because I'm not even sure it's making sense to me. Okay. And if that's perhaps my, my failing here, but I, I would just push back and say there's no way to capture this information in a sax parser or a DOM builder. There's no field called space between equal sign and quote marks, to put it sort of um, you know, cutely. So yes, clean it up, because there's no way of remembering that it was even there. Yeah, I'm just like, why am I spending time doing this? It's, I could just not need it. I don't need it anyway. No, I mean, the idea is when you're parsing an XML document and you have, for instance, attribute equal sign value pairs, well, you should just be churning along. And as soon as you see, so suppose that it is this example. Suppose it's foo equals, with a clear space there, bar. I mean, presumably your parser is going to be implemented by way of a for loop or a while loop or whatever. And you're going to be iterating character by character, eating up these characters and appending them to some string called name. But then as soon as you reach some white space, you're going to keep uh, just 
uh, you're going to say, that's the end of the name. Let's tuck that string away. Now let's just iterate over white space, white space, white space. Oh, here's an interesting token. Now let's change into read value mode. Oh, here's some meaningless white space. Spin, 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 spin in a loop. Ah, oh, here's the quote mark. Now start retaining B, A, R. Oh, quote mark. Let's tuck just those three characters away in the value variable and then repeat the process for the next attribute value pair. In other words, so yes, clean this up because your parser should just be skipping over it as meaningless. Right? It just so happens that you're going to have to make intelligent use of conditions because if there is no white space and we just have a ridiculously long equal sign here to capture that idea, you're going to read F O O O equal sign, I'm done reading the name. Just so happens now the next thing you hit is the quote mark, oh, start of value. So again, the story is the same. It's just sometimes your conditions are going to evaluate to false if it's white space, or true if it's not, or vice versa. So, other questions? I feel like everyone's lingering for the big secret that makes the whole project go away. <laughs> <laughs> there really is none. But it is fun. And know that Mahesh will have some online office hours, an online section. Um, we're certainly available via email over the next two weeks, even though we won't have lecture or section next week. This is more than enough time. And I would say don't leave it for the last minute just because you can consider that a true vacation week rather than the week to do your homework. Yep. Yeah, another question on the computer side. Mm -hmm.